is the answer. Let's stop talking about it. So here's what's going to happen. One of the TAs will come down in about five minutes, take those quizzes up to be alphabetically sorted. And once I finish my second class, the second class ends at 4.45, I'll start grading. Let's grade this quiz first. And once it's graded, I will let you know that it's been graded and you can pick it up. I'm not going to hand it out in class. It's an incredible waste of time. And you can pick it up on the ninth floor of KMEC. It'll be outside, face down, in alphabetical order. Right? That's why I asked you to write your name on the back, because uh, don't browse. This is Barnes & Noble. So basically, you know where your name is. Alphabetically, you shouldn't be saying, I don't know where it is. I've looked through every quiz. It'll all be phased up. So I know for some of you, this might be an in incredible invasion of privacy. So if you feel exposed because your quiz is going to be out there, let me know and I will keep the quiz in my office. The downside then is you got to find me in my office to get the quiz. So if you want to get your quiz back, you'll probably help sooner than you think from me. Okay? So watch your email. And when I send the email, I will send the solution then. I won't send it right now because I know exactly what will happen if you get the solution now, is all these dire scenarios will play out. You'll be convinced you got only two on the quiz because you don't think any partial credit is going to matter. So I'm going to hold off till you have your quizzes and you can check it against the solution. And I tell you, I make mistakes. So check the solution. If I screw it up, bring it in. I would love to tell you that mistakes on both sides will be brought to me. But this is a very asymmetric game, which is, Mistakes in your favor will probably get exposed and mistakes um, will not get exposed. Mistakes that don't work against you, you're going to bring to me. That's fine. I understand that. But um, I will put the solutions out. There'll be a little, uh, when, I, when I send the Excel spreadsheet of the solution, there'll be a grading template so you can see how many points I took off. It should be pretty transparent. So if you lose a point and a half, it should specify exactly where you lost the point and a half and un unless I've overlooked something. Maybe you wrote on the back of the page and you never, I never looked at it. For the most part, it should be directly related to what you did on the quiz. Okay. okay, so let's go back to where we were at the end of the last class. We were just finishing up with free cash flow equity. Free cash flow equity is, remember, is cash flows left over after debt payments. And we did the full calculation, right? Net income minus reinvestment. And then we had these cash flows to and from debt. Debt issuances minus debt repayments. There's a shortcut that can sometimes be used. Keyword is sometimes. And that shortcut can be used only if you're willing to make an assumption. The assumption has to be that you're willing to keep a debt ratio that is stable and fixed from this point on. So let's suppose you tell me that from this day on, you're going to finance 25% of your reinvestment from debt. Here's the shortcut you can use to get to free cash flow equity. Start with net income. Subtract out the 75% of the net capex that comes from equity. Because after all, as an equity investor, all you care about is how much do I have to come up with. Subtract out the 75% of the change in working capital. And what you left with, you're saying, what happened to that debt issuance and debt repayments? If your debt ratio is stable, remember all debt repayments are going to be covered by new debt. Because if you replace them with equity, your debt ratio will change. This basically allows the debt to increase as your company grows. So it keeps your debt ratio stable over time. Mature companies, if you ever ask to estimate free cash flow equity, you can get away with this approach because the debt ratio is stable. So let me try this. The company I'm going to use to illustrate this is a company I've been using in my corporate finance class for a long time. And this is from my very first edition of the book when I was doing it in 98 or 99. I was trying to compute a free cash flow equity for this. So let me go through the numbers. Net income of $1.533 billion. Net CapEx was $612 million, difference between CapEx and depreciation. And working capital increased by $477 million. So net CapEx is $612, working capital increased by $477 million. Their debt ratio was about 25%. So basically, I'm sorry, 24%. 23.83% to be precise. Let's assume they're going to maintain that debt ratio from this day on. We start with net income, subtract out the portion of equity, which is 76% of equity of 612 million. 76% of 477 million is 363 million. I subtract those out. I come up with a free cash flow equity of 704 million. 
You can try the full approach. In fact, take Disney, work out the full approach. You should get exactly the same number. If you put a dollar debt issuance and dollar debt repayment, it's just a shortcut that works if your debt ratio stays good. So it's not a different equation. It's the same equation that simplifies because you have a stable debt ratio. Any questions on the mechanics here? So it basically makes forecasting easier because all you have to do is forecast net income, net cap exchange and working capital, and then give me a debt ratio. You don't have to debt issuances and repayments, which are a pain in the neck to forecast because you've got to decide when debt comes due, what debt you're going to, whether you're going to issue debt or not, this saves you the trouble. I'm going to take this calculation and play a little game. The debt ratio I'm using here is 23.83%, right? Let's assume I used a 30% debt ratio. As an equity investor, tell me what this does to your free cash flow equity. So take a look at the equation. Starting today, I'm going to issue 30%. Your net income is unaffected because that's based on what you've already borrowed, right? If I'm borrowing 30% or 23, 24%, the equity portion that I have to come up with gets smaller, my free cash flow equity gets bigger. This seems too good to be true. If I raise my debt ratio, my free cash flow equity keeps climbing and climbing and climbing. And you're saying, this is good. Value of equity is tied to free cash flow equity. Free cash flow equity gets higher. If my debt ratio gets higher, my value of equity should go up. That can't be right. What am I missing here? This is half the equation. I'm looking at cash flows. These are free cash flows equity. To value equity, what do I need to discount those cash flows at? The cost of equity. And what drives the cost of equity? What's the only input that's company specific in the cost of equity? The beta, right? Because the risk-free rate and the risk premium are market set numbers. And how do we estimate betas? We look at the business you're in and we lever the beta up, right? Based on your debt to equity ratio. Do you see the other shoe waiting to drop? As I raise my debt ratio, my cash flow to equity will increase. Real estate developers know this, right? They keep talking about how much they will benefit from borrowing money. You're right. Your return equity will go up. Your free cash flow equity per share will go up. But guess what? Your cost of equity is also going up. And the net effect is what's going to determine the value of equity. So my last question on the free cash flow equity calculation is about the net effect. So let's summarize. Increasing your debt ratio increases your free cash flow equity. Increasing your debt ratio also increases your cost of equity. Your discount rate is rising, your cash flow is rising. I'm going to read a series of statements and you tell me whether this is the way to think about debt in the context of value of equity. First statement is that increasing leverage will increase value because the cash flow effect will always dominate the discount rate. If that were true, where, would we, every, where should every company end up at? 99% debt, right? So that can't be true. Otherwise, leverage would be this gift that keeps on giving. How about the second statement? Increasing leverage will decrease value because the discount rate effect will always dominate the cash flow effect. If that were true, no company should ever borrow money. What about the third one? It's a very strange statement, but hang in there. Increasing leverage will not affect my value because my cash flow effect will be exactly offset. By my, by my discount rate effect. Does that sound mildly familiar from your corporate finance class? You guys remember Miller Modigliani? Somewhere in your corporate finance class, you talked about Miller Modigliani, right? It's this homage you pay in finance, right? Great gods of finance, Merton Miller and Franco Modigliani. But what's the Miller Modigliani theorem say? That's the assumption, but what's the conclusion of the model? That the value of the firm is going to be unaffected by debt. And people are always mystified. How can that be? In a world where your cash flow effects are exactly offset by your discount rate effect, you know what that world would have to look like? There can be no taxes because taxes tilt the scales. And there can be no default risk because default risk, tilt. if you take those two big things out, you essentially will end up with your cost of capital staying the same no matter what your debt ratio is. It's not magical. Because your cost of capital is not the cost of raising money. It's a risk in your operations that's driving it, right? Changing a mix of debt and equity can't change that risk. So fundamentally, Merton Miller and Franco Modigliani were pointing out something that people miss, which is playing games with your debt ratio is not making your company more or less valuable unless the government lends you a helping hand. 
And that's what taxes do. Or puts in a penalty, which is what bankruptcy does. So in a world with no taxes and no default risk, your cash flow effects will be offset exactly by your discount rate effects. But that's not the world I live in. I don't think that's the world you live in. We live in a world with taxes. We're approaching tax day and I haven't done my taxes yet. And I'm sure you all have to do your taxes as well. And we live in a world with default risk, right? Companies go bankrupt. They're unable to make debt payments. In that world, increasing leverage will sometimes help you and will sometimes hurt you. That's why we have an optimal debt ratio. So if you do co in corporate finance, the way we do this is by minimizing, minimizing the cost of capital. This is another way to get to the same end game. Change your debt ratio, see what happens to your cash flow to equity, see what happens to your discount rate, compute the value of equity. There will be a mix of debt and equity at which your equity value is maximized. That is, in a sense, your optimal debt ratio. So that's it for cash flows. Let's talk about where the rubber beats the road. Up till now, whenever you're asked to estimate something, you can point to uh, it's the accountant's fault. I got the beta from the modern online. There's always somebody else to blame. Now is the time to take ownership evaluation because you got to project out the future. Nobody cares what last year brought. So I want to talk about what it is that drives growth. But before I do that, I want to put a statement on the table that I've said before, but I want to reemphasize. There is this sense, at least in investing, that growth is good. That high growth companies are better than low growth companies, right? When was the last time you heard somebody get on CNBC? I really like this company. It's got shrinking revenues. Growth is good, not growing is bad. And that's a very dangerous conclusion to reach because growth can add value. Growth can do nothing for value. And growth can actually destroy value. To understand the trade-off on growth, let's think of the good side of growth. The good side of growth is as you grow, your revenues get larger, your income gets larger, your cash flows get larger, right? In the future. What's a bad side of growth? To get that growth, you have to put money back into the business. If you're a manufacturing company in plant and equipment, if you're a technology company in R&D. So what you're giving up are cash flows now for growth in the future. And already you can see why sometimes the trade-off can work in your favor and sometimes it might not. We'll come up with simple metrics for capturing whether growth is good or bad. But I think this is something I want to put on the table because I, you know, when you look at the percentage of companies globally that actually destroy value while they grow, it's just astonishingly large. So clearly companies have taken this to heart. We need to grow at any cost. And you see companies say that we want to grow at any cost. It's a horrifically bad objective because you can grow at any cost. Just go do acquisitions every year. You'll get bigger as a company, but you'll get less valuable as a company. So with that lead in, let's talk, let's talk about the ways in which you can estimate growth. Generically, when you have to estimate growth for your company, and hopefully you've already picked a company, I won't harass you anymore, though your master list is the least populated of my three master lists right now. So either you're holding your company mysterious and you don't want to let me know you haven't picked a company. I don't even want to go there if you haven't picked a company. But once you've picked a company, you've got to forecast growth, right? Look at the three places you go. First, you look at the past. It's logical sense, right? If you're going to grow, make a growth projection, you want to see how quickly your company has grown. Last three years, last five years. So we're going to start with what's called historical growth, a fancy word. Let's look at history and let's see how quickly has our company has grown. That sounds like it should be a fact, right? But looking backwards, if I asked you, what's the historical growth rate for Coca-Cola for this room? And you all came back next Monday with a growth rate. We should all agree, right? But we won't because there are choices you will make on what, you know, the time window you look at. The metric you focus on, is it revenues? Is it operating income? Is it EBITDA? It's net income. Even the way you estimate growth rate can make a difference. You can use arithmetic averages or look at a compounded average. So I'm going to start with historical growth. Look at how to estimate it and why you should be a little careful about just extrapolating past growth. In fact, you should be very glad that future growth cannot be extrapolated from past growth. You know what? If future growth is going to be extrapolated from past growth, why do you need a human being in this process? Chat GPT 
Forget about chat GPT. You've been able to do this for 40 years. Just take an Excel spreadsheet, make every line item grow at past growth rates, you're done, right? But that's a good place to start. Look at historical growth. But you're going to be, you know, when you look at the historical growth, you're going to say, I don't know whether I'm right. I don't know much about this company. I just picked this company two weeks ago. I've never done a valuation before. The second way we estimate growth is we outsource. Or else we don't even outsource or else we ask somebody else, what growth rate should I use? Don't let that somebody else be me because I'm not going to give you an answer. But in valuation, you constantly look outwards. You know, with most private company appraisers, you know where they get their growth rates for their earnings and revenues? They get it from the management of the companies they've had. They go to ask the managers, how quickly can you grow? Talk about bias forecast, right? But this way, if something goes wrong, they say the managers gave me this number, I just use those numbers. If you're valuing a publicly traded company, you look for experts, people who spend all their time looking at these companies. In public markets, you know who those people are, right? If you're valuing Coca Cola, there are 55 analysts, sell side equity research analysts whose entire life is focused on forecasting earnings at Coca Cola. You might think that they know more than you do. You're mistaken, but you might think that they do and use their growth rates as a substitute saying, look, I don't know much about the company, but they must. So we'll talk about analyst estimates of growth and whether they come in closer to earnings and using some time series model. So you can look at the past, you can outsource your growth rate, or you can go back to the business because ultimately you and I don't have the power to go around endowing companies with high growth just because we like them. Growth has to be earned. What does that mean? To grow, you got to pull off this trick of reinvesting money and reinvesting well at the same time. You know why it's a trick? It's easy to reinvest a lot of money. Anybody can do it. But if you reinvest a lot of money, often you're earning low returns. It's easy to earn a high return if you pick only one project a year and just say, I'm going to just pick one project a year. But to pull off this trick of reinvesting a lot and reinvesting well at the same time is what creates quality growth. We're going to create this, what I call a sustainable growth equation. And it's not an equation. It forces you to think about the business, how much it's reinvesting, how well it's reinvesting, and coming up with the growth based on that. So let's start with historical growth. Today, getting past numbers for any company is trivial. I hope you've signed up for S&P Capital like you're another nag I've made, and I'm going to let, let it hang out there if you haven't done it. You can pull the last, you know, if, you, if it's Coca-Cola, you can pull their entire life's earning going back 40, 50 years in one Excel spreadsheet. Think about what the choices are that you make that can affect what you end up with as a growth rate. The first is, I said, a purely statistical choice. If I gave you 10 years of earnings for a company and say, what growth rate did this company have over those last 10 years? You can compute an arithmetic average. You know what that involves? Take the growth rate each year, add the numbers up, divide by 10. Or you can look at a geometric average or a compounded growth rate where you take the earnings in 10 years ago, the earnings today. You don't need any of the intermediate numbers. And say, what growth rate would get me from where I was 10 years ago to what I'm today? There are people who actually bring in you know, heavy ammunition into this game. They bring in regression models, but basically they're doing pretty much the same thing. Do I want an arithmetic average or a compounded average? Second, the time period you pick can affect your growth rate. If you want to show a really high growth rate for your company, the easiest way to do it is to pick a base year that was a terrible year. You take 2020 as your base year for a hotel, it's going to look amazing because you had nothing in revenues that year and you have a billion dollars, you can say that's 100% growth rate. The time period matters. And the metric you're looking at also matters. Are you looking at revenues or operating income? Growth and earnings is a meaningless statement unless you tell me, uh, is it operating income? Is it net income? Is it EBITDA? You can get very different growth rates. And finally, there are these mechanical issues that we sometimes overlook when we think about growth rates. We think growth rates are always going to be calculated. That they're, you know, let me give you an example where you're going to run into an issue. Let's suppose you have a company that had minus 100 million in net income last year, has a plus 100 million in net income this year. I challenge you to tell me what the growth rate in this company was 
We know it is a good year, right? We have minus 100. Think about it. What's the growth rate you would give this company? I'm going to take you through the mechanics of computing growth rate, and you're going to get a completely counterintuitive number if you just plug the numbers in we use for typical growth rates. We have to talk about how do we deal with negative numbers to come up with growth rates. We also have to deal with the fact that as companies scale up, their growth rates will decrease. It's almost a mathematical given. When you have a dollar income, doubling that income is not a big deal. When you have a billion dollars, 100% growth rate is a lot of income. So we're going to talk about that scaling issue and how to bring that in when you estimate growth. So let's start with the first of these questions. Let's talk about arithmetic averages versus geometric averages. First reaction most people have is, how different can they be? So I took this as a very old example of Motorola in the late 90s. I have five years, six, five years of growth rates in revenues, EBIT, dyne, EBIT. I'm showing you three different metrics. I've computed the arithmetic average, just to add the numbers up and divide by five, mm. and the geometric average, which is basically taking the ending number and the starting number, and then, you know, you know how to compute the geometric average, just take the ending and the starting number and raise it to the power one-fifth, basically, because it's a compounded growth rate. Let's take revenues. The arithmetic average is 7.08%. The geometric average is 6.82%, already is saying, what a waste of time. I'm pretty close to the same number. You're right, with revenues, we were pretty close. If you go to EBITDA, the arithmetic average is 10.9%. The geometric average is 5.39%. I'm getting twice the growth rate when I use an arithmetic average. And when I go to EBIT, my arithmetic average is 42.45%. My geometric average is around four. I'm getting 10 times as high a growth rate. Why as I shift metrics? There's actually a statistical reason why the arithmetic average and ge geometric average are diverging. To see what that reason is, think about the only condition when they will give you the same answer. What has to be true about your growth rate for arithmetic and geometric averages to exactly match up? They have to be the same. The more standard deviation there is, the volatility there is, the growth rate, the bigger the divergence there will be between arithmetic and geometric averages. That's why with stock returns, I made such a big deal about compounding geometric averages because stock returns are incredibly noisy. With T-bills, it doesn't make that much of a difference. There's not that much variance. So as you go down the income statement, you have to be more and more careful about whether I'm... You so if somebody's telling you growth rate for a company... Stop them and say, first, what, did, what, grow, what earnings are you looking at? Earnings per share? I have to really worry. Is it an arithmetic average or a geometric average? Because you can get wildly different numbers. Second, let's talk about money losing to money made. Now, Time Warner in the late 90s was coming off a big LBO. They had a lot of debt. They were losing money. In fact, they went from an earnings per share of minus five cents, but they turned the corner to an earnings per share of 25 cents before we compute growth rates. This is good, right? You went from negative to positive. Let's assume you compute growth rates mechanically. The way you compute growth rates is you take the change in earnings and you divide by the earnings per share last year. It always is. If I use that measure for growth, my change in earnings is 30 cents. What goes in my denominator? Minus 25 cents, um, minus five cents, which gives me a growth rate of minus 600%. Already that's starting not to make sense, right? I had a really good year and there's a minus in front of my growth rate. Is there an easy way to fix it? Yeah, just take the pencil board that way. It becomes plus. That's one trick that people play when they have negative to positive is they use the absolute value of last year. You put a mathematical spin on it, it looks more sophisticated than just drawing a line. But it makes minus 600 to plus 600%. Here's a second trick you can try. What's the problem here? Is the numerator or the, or the denominator? Denominator, right? What if I took the higher of the two numbers and put it in my, you, know, you can see we're really playing games here, but if I took the higher of the two numbers, I'll take the 30 cents and divide by the 25 cents, I get 120%. You can already see that when you go from negative to positive, while I can try every conceivable game here, the bottom line is the growth rate becomes almost useless because Remember, the reason we're computing growth is to project out the future. Minus 600% doesn't work, plus 600 doesn't work, plus 120 doesn't. You're saying what would work? How about NMF? It's the most honest way. Not NMF is not meaningful. 
It's better to say, look, there is no meaningful growth rate when I go from negative to positive. I can't use historical growth. Still, you have other ways of estimating growth. It's better to not try to estimate growth when you have these mechanical issues. So when you think about, about negative earnings, don't give up, but at the same time, recognize that that growth rate you get might not be a number you want to use. One final thing, you know, at least caveat about past growth. Let's say you have a young company. It's a small company that's actually had a very good five or 10 year period. You look at its growth rate over the last five or 10 years and you, you do things carefully. You compute a compounded average growth. So you're following all the rules. You come up with a really high number. And then you feel tempted by saying, look, this company is still good. It's got great management. It still has a great product. I'm just going to extrapolate that growth for the next five years. Be careful what you can create. You can create monsters with growth rates that are extraordinary. I'm going to illustrate this with a company called Callaway Golf. Callaway Golf was a company that came out of nowhere to become one of the most successful golf companies or sporting companies in the early 90s. You know what they're, the product that launched them into fame was, right? Now it's golf balls. When they say Callaway, people say golf. But the original product was the Big Bertha, which was a golf club. And the thing about golf is everybody is terrible at golf, but they're always convinced that it's because they have the wrong club or the wrong ball or the wrong pro or the wrong fit. I mean, you blame something else, which is great for merchandising because, look, if you buy the Big Bertha, you're going to play like Tiger Woods. And Big Bertha took off. And to show you how much it took off, this was the five-year historical data I was looking at in 1997 when I looked at Callaway Golf. Their net income went from 1.8 million to 120 million. So let's start with facts. Did they have a great five years? Absolutely. They compounded growth rate. The geometric average was 102% a year. They're still run by the same people. They still have the golf club. Saying, why can't I just use 102% for the next five years? Because this is what will happen to your net income if you do. Effectively, we all, even if we don't play golf, We'll have to buy big birthdays and put them in our closet, maybe as weapons. Every American will be required to own a golf club, and it has to come from. You can see the story is frayed, but in a sense, using high growth rates can sometimes lead you to numbers. You look and say, there is no way my company can do that. So start by looking at past growth rates. But be careful, it's not a fact, there are estimation judgments you're making. And for most companies, historical growth is not a great predictor of future growth. In fact, uh, one of my favorite studies, partly because of the title of the study, in the early 60s, this Englishman comes over and gets a PhD in economics at one of the, one of the, one of the US universities, and he writes a thesis. And his thesis, he was examining a question. It was a very simple question. He said, can I use past earnings growth as a predictor of future earnings growth? Remember those days, you didn't have huge databases. So what he did was he took the growth rate from 1950 through 55 in earnings for every company and 56 through 60 in earnings for every company. And he was saying, if I know the earnings from 50 to 55, how well does it help me forecast 56 through 60 earnings growth? Now, earnings, historical growth is a great predictor of future growth. What should you expect to see as a correlation? High positive, even if it's not high positive, high earnings growth should lead to high earnings growth. I, I won't give away what he found. I'll give you the title of his paper. It's one of my favorite research you know, titles ever. Called, the title of his PhD thesis was Higgledy Piggledy Growth. You know what he found as a correlation? What's your worst case scenario if you're using historical growth? Negative one would be great because then what you do is you take whatever the past growth is, you put a, you know, you go to the other end of the spectrum. Your worst scenario is it's close to zero, which is, which is what he found. You know, when you see these investment banking valuations where everything is forecast using historical growth numbers, maybe we should buy copies of Higgledy Piggledy Growth. Now, maybe, you don't even have to read it, right? Leave it on the bookshelf, Higgledy Piggledy Growth. It'll be a reminder to be cautious when you keep extrapolating past growth. So start with past growth. Don't get too dependent on it because it is not a great predictor of future. 
So let's move on to equity research analysis. I'll wager no matter what company you pick, you could be the most obscure emerging. Every, every company now in the world seems to have equity research analysts at Fordham. In fact, if you have access to Capital IQ or you go on IBES and you know Zacks, you can get forecasted earnings growth for your company. It seems like a godsend when you value your company. There's a growth rate right there. But first, you have to remember what analysts forecast growth in. Yeah. Analysts don't forecast growth in revenues. They don't even forecast growth in EBITDA. They forecast growth in earnings per share. That's the metric analysts are most focused on. And it's true. Analysts spend all of their time tracking 15 or 20 companies. And it's true that they spend a great deal of their time forecasting earnings per share in future periods. So they must be much better than the rest of us. I mean, think of the resources they have, the time they have. Their forecast of earnings per share must be much better than some time series model or just looking at the past, right? I'm going to show you the research on analyst forecast. And it's a little depressing, especially if you're a sell-side equity research analyst. So think of the tens of millions of dollars we spend on sell-side equity research, all the time going to forecasting. I'll start with the good news. When you look at their forecast of earnings, one way to measure the quality of a forecast, look at how different it is from actual earnings. So if you get perfect forecast, the standard error of, your, of the difference should be close to zero. In other words, you're always coming. So you want this number to be as low as possible. There have been studies over time, last 50 years, probably 10, 15 studies that compare analyst forecast of earnings with time series models, with chat GPT or AI could do, or just a computer could forecast. The good news is if you look at one quarter ahead forecast, you know what I mean by one quarter ahead, next quarter's earnings, analyst forecasts are better than time series models, but barely. So the difference is the standard error of a time series model might be 32%. The analyst forecast is at 28%. Not at 0% or 2%, but at 28%. You're buying yourself a 4% improvement in forecast with all the tens of millions of dollars. You say, I'm okay with that. That's one quarter ahead. If you go, go to two quarters ahead, even that advantage disappears. Five years forecast, just looks like a time series model. So I actually present this to equity research analysts and they don't like it, but it is what it is. You know what their excuse is, right? If it's New York based, they say there are a lot of very bad sell side equity research analysts out there. None of them are in this room. They're bringing down the quality of their forecast. If you focused in on the very best equity research analysts, I'm sure they do much better. So I said, okay, I'll focus on the very best equity research analysts. You know how in football, you've got these all-American teams where they go in and pick in each position. You know, in sell side equity research analysts, there are all-American teams. Institutional investors have been doing this for 40 years, where they go into each sector and they pick the all-America analyst in that sector. If you're a sell side equity research analyst, this is the pinnacle of your life. There's no further up. You've got Mount Everest. You hit the, you know, all America. So in fact, once you become an all America analyst, it becomes part of your name. You're no longer Joe Brown. You're Joe Brown, all America analyst. That's how you introduce yourself to others, to your own family. You ask your kids to call you just all America for short, you know, because you want to remind everybody, I'm an all America analyst. And there are studies that look at these all-American analysts. They're the best of the lot. They must be better, right? And they find something very strange. And maybe you can explain this to me. They look at the forecast errors of these all-American analysts in the year before they become all-American analysts. And you know what they find? They're actually a little worse than the typical analysts. And then they look at them the year after, and something magical happens. They're a little better than the typical analysts. See, this is self-esteem playing out. You become a better forecaster if you think more of yourself. I don't think so. What do you think happens after you become an all-American analyst that might make you a better forecaster? More conservative? Conservative will mean you're undershooting, right? Conservative can doesn't necessarily mean that you're making a better forecast. More access to management. No. Remember, the only advantage you get as a sell side analyst is these little twinges of information. Remember, in the US, it's illegal for companies to actually give you explicit information as a sell side analyst if you're not giving it to the market. And companies 
enforce it pretty strongly because the SEC can very quickly crack down. So you've got to give people little, little nuggets which are not quite information, things like our shelves are getting empty. And then you read in whatever the rest you want to read into. If you're Joe Brown, equity research analyst, you call Coca-Cola, they say, who are you again? Oh, Joe Brown, we'll get back to you. Hang up the phone. You're Joe Brown, all America analysts. Let me get the CEO for you because he might want to talk to you. Your access improves. And there's another magical thing that happens. You know, when analysts put out buy and sell recommendations, there's a price effect. Because people know, people pick up on the buy, they start buying as well, they pick up on the sell. With all America analysts, I'll tell you what the price effect is. And maybe again, you can explain the disparity. When they put out buy recommendations, the stock goes up about 3%. When they put out sell recommendations, on the date of the recommendation, the stock price drops about 4.7%. You think that makes sense, buy free. If you track these stocks about four, six, eight weeks after the recommendation, buy recommendations, that 3% you got on the recommendation date completely disappears. But with sell recommendations, it not only persists, it actually gets worse. In other words, there seems to be a much more lasting price impact when you make a sell recommendation than when you make a buy recommendation. What do you think that is? Yes. It's so rare that you make a sell recommendation. First, you think, I put out a sell recommendation. This company must be on the verge of disaster. Because remember what we said, you never say the word sell. It's nine to one, right? Nine buys forever. It used to be 20 to one, nine to one. So the fact that you put out a sell recommendation must mean you're seeing things here that must be catastrophic. Second, you are burning your bridges, right? That must mean that there is something. Buy, you might put out, say, maybe the equity research analyst got a big dinner at, you know, whatever the most expensive restaurant in New York was, and he put a buy recommendation on it. You're not going to put a sell recommendation just because he got a big dinner, because think what you're leaving on the table. So if you look at forecasting accuracy, analysts are not bringing much. There's a price effect, but it's more on sells than buys. Which then raises the question of why is this happening? I mean, we have all these, I mean, these are not a, a surprisingly large number of people who go through this class have ended up as sell side equity research actors. I won't name names. In spite of all of my efforts to talk them out of doing it, they've ended up as sell side equity research actors. They're bright people, they know valuation. So why aren't they adding more value? So I've come up with a list of reasons. If any of you are going to sell side equity research, you have to fix these problems to make sell side equity research some kind of value added proposition. The first is tunnel vision. Remember how sell side equity research works. You're put into a sector, you're given 15 companies. What are you told? Forget the rest of the world exists. This is your universe. That's not healthy in investing. Why? Because you get so focused on your 15 companies, you forget the rest of the world is out there. And here's how it plays out. Remember you're a dot-com analyst, every company in your sector trades at 500 times revenues, company comes along that trades at 300 times revenues, you think it's an incredible bargain. Your perspective has been skewed. So we you know what we need to do to fix this, right? I think we need to take away this sector focus, maybe rotate equity research analysts through sectors. Not only will this solve the tunnel vision problem, it'll also mean you're less inclined to worry about what will the management think about me because I'm going to work with these same 15 companies. Second, you've got a whole lot of lemmingitis in sell side equity research. The way sell side equity research works is they revise their, remember I said they make earnings per share estimates. Sometimes you see a revision to an estimate that an analyst said, Goldman Sachs has raised the expected earnings per share for Tesla from 10 cents to 12 cents. Keep your eyes on the news, you know, the news wires for the next three or four days. You're going to get a whole bunch of other analysts also revise their earnings up because you want to be part of the crowd. The third is what I, you know, what I think of as a variation of the Stockholm syndrome. Remember the Stockholm syndrome of the 70s? It was concocted to explain why a hostage after a while starts to identify more with the hostage takers than the people trying to rescue them. I think it was in the aftermath of the Paddy Hearst kidnapping in the early 70s. You think, what's that got to do with equity research? 
If you think about equity research objectively, your job as a sell side analyst is to be objective. Look at a company and say, is it being run right? Is it fairly priced? At some point in time, though, the relationship becomes so blurred that the equity research analyst seems to think it's his or her job to defend the company against people who might attack. Take a look at some of the people who follow Tesla and equity research analysts. You can't call them equity. Re They're cheerleaders. I once saw a Tesla sell side equity research analyst get into an argument with Elon Musk and tell him he was underestimating the expected potential of Tesla. I won't name the name. This guy's actually a very high profile equity research analyst. That's the minute I said I will never, ever read one of his reports because hey, you might as well have Kathy Wood as a co-author and you can collectively say the stock is worth $15 trillion. The fourth is a lot of factor phobia. Remember I said valuation stories and numbers. You need to sell side equity research. You'll see a lot of stories. You'll see a lot of numbers, but no connection between the two. It's amazing, in fact. You'll have 50 pages and there'll be lots of tables, lots of stories. Stories that are not connected numbers can become fairy tales. You're not Charles Dickens or Stephen King. You can't create universes of your own. You're not a novelist. And finally, there is this Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde component to sell side equity research. And here's why, especially in the US or pretty much everywhere around the world, you think of yourself, you're part of an investment bank. In the Europe, you're part of a commercial bank. And your investment, and remember, in much of the world, sell-side equity research is not a revenue business. You give it away for free. Why? Because you hope your clients will use your investment bank or your commercial bank as a conduit. But not just trading, but if you're a company that you will use the investment bank to go public and to do, that's a Dr. Jekyll Hyde, because when you, as a sell-side equity research analyst, have two masters to serve, you're not sure who you're serving at any point in time. So I think there's a lot of work to be done in sell-side equity research because it's lost all credibility. It's just as laugh value. If you don't believe me, watch buy recommendations. You know when they'll pop up after the stock has hit 1.2 trillion? You know when sell recommendations pop up? After it's gone down to 150 billion. It's almost become a negative indicator of where will the stock go because they're chasing the price up and down. They're not valuing the company. So here are three propositions about, about analyst growth rates. First is, there's far less public information in analyst forecasts than you think. It's not like they're bringing in some private information you don't have. The second is, the biggest source of any private information to an analyst is the company itself. You think, so what? The company knows more than the rest of us do about its future, but it's also biased. It's like a journalist whose biggest source is the politician he or she, she is supposed to cover. You're going to get spin, you're going to get leaks, and you're going to transmit the leaks, but you're not going to get the truth because the company has an agenda. So my advice to you, and that's the third proposition, is look up the growth rate in earnings and analysts are projecting for your company, but don't be swayed by it. So if your growth rate is 5% and analysts are projecting 25%, don't assume you're wrong and the analysts are right. Dig a little deeper. Maybe there is something you're missing that you need to bring in, or maybe there isn't. And the analyst is just projecting numbers that have really no base in them. I'm going to, now, the last couple of minutes, let me at least set up the last way of thinking about growth. I'm going to set it up as a picture. Let's say you have a company that has a billion dollars invested in existing projects on which it's making 12% as a return, 12% of a billion, so its current earnings are 120 million. Just as a very simplistic example, let's assume this company goes out and invests 100 million in new projects on which it continues to make 12%. Next year, when I look at its net income, it's going to make 120 million plus an extra 12 million or 132 million. The change in earnings, and this is pure math, is 12 million. Where is it coming from? The addition I made to the investment base, the 100 million, and the return I'm making on that investment base. In other words, I can't grow if I'm not adding to my investment base and earning a return on that investment. That is the basis for sustainable growth. In fact, if I took this and stated it as, a, as, as ratios, I invested 100 million out of the 120 million. So think of that as what I'm reinvesting. 83.33% of my income went in. My return on investment was 
83.33% times 12% gives me a growth rate of 10%, which is exactly what I got as a growth, right? 12 million on a $120 million net income. My growth rate is equal to the return that I make on my new investments times the reinvestment. That's a lot of work, right? To grow, then you got to reinvest, you got to reinvest well. Is there a shortcut to growth? Yes, but there's a caveat. You know the shortcut to growth is, remember the 12% you're making on your existing investments? If you can raise that to 13%, are you going to grow next year? Absolutely. It's called efficiency growth. So when you think about growth, there are two ways to grow. One is efficiency growth. One is growth by adding to your investment base. And you're saying, I'll take the efficiency growth. You can, but here's the caveat. If you tell me you're going to grow in the long term by reinvesting in new projects and earning a return, it's believable, right? Because you can keep adding to your base. If you tell me you're going to grow in the long term and it's all going to come from efficiency growth, you see the logical problem there? You can make yourself more efficient next year. Next year, it's going to get even more, but you keep improving. There's going to be a point where you hit a, a ceiling. You can become only so efficient. So if you tell me you're going to grow through becoming more efficient over the next three years, I'll be okay with it, but not for the next 10 years, the next 30 years or forever. So through when we start up on Monday, we're going to talk about sustainable growth and bringing in efficiency growth, but keep those two growth rates open and think about your company and where it might be able to grow, at least for the near future. I will see you on Monday, but watch for the email on your quizzes and when it's ready up on the ninth floor and I'll tell you.